Welcome. I'm Craig a reporter here at GBH, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this month's Beyond the Page Summer Reading. In a few minutes, we're going to be joined by Kirsten Chen, an award-winning New York Times best-selling author of three novels. Their latest novel, Counterfeit, being picked for Reese's Book Club, along with being recommended by the Washington Post, People Magazine, Vogue, Oprah, Harper's Bazaar, and the list goes on. She's also the author of Soy Sauce for Beginners and Bury What We Cannot Take with a lot of her other work appearing in The Cut, Writer's Digest, Real Simple, and Literary Hub. Born and raised in Singapore, Chen now lives in San Francisco, teaching creative writing at the University of San Francisco. Now, before I welcome Kirsten to the screen, I want to explain how this evening is going to work. Uh, we're using Zoom webinar uh, as our audience. We can't see or hear you. Don't worry about what you're wearing. But we do want to hear from you. You can ask questions during the course of the conversation by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. You can also put your questions in at any point of the conversation. Uh, so just go ahead and type them in. And we'll do our best to address as many questions as we can throughout the night. If you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, give it a vote. Give it a thumbs up by clicking the thumbs up icon in the Q&A tab. The most popular questions are going to rise to the top of the list. And those are the ones we're going to make sure to get to first are the, the most popular questions. So definitely upvote the ones you want to see the answer to or hear the answer to. Um, to activate the Zoom automated captioning feature, select closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can select the live transcript button. Uh, two transcription display options are going to pop up. We recommend you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript and you're going to a sidebar window that opens up where you can see what each speaker is saying. Uh, but please bear in mind that the closed captioning might be slightly delayed. Uh, and now that that housekeeping is done, it is my pleasure to introduce Kirsten Chen. Kirsten, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. We're delighted that you're here and we have so many questions for you. I just want to say just on the outset, like Counterfeit is just, it's such a fantastic read. I've really enjoyed it. For people who are joining us who maybe have read your earlier books but haven't picked this one up yet or, or uh, if they haven't quite finished it, can you start out by telling us a little bit about this new novel and how you came to write it? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So Counterfeit is the story of two Asian American women who band together to grow counterfeit handbag scheme into a global enterprise, shattering the model minority myth along the way. Um, and um, to be perfectly honest, the idea for this book kind of started as a joke. Um, I was working on my last novel, Bury What We Cannot Take, which is a very different book. It's um, set in 1950s Southern China. It's um, a kind of weighty political story. Um, and it was a novel that required an incredible amount of research. Um, and so when I was working on that book, I remember after a particularly grueling day of research, I turned to my spouse and I said, um, listen, the next book that I write is going to have to require zero research, and it's going to have to be about a topic I already know about. And the only thing I can think of is designer handbags, because I happen to love designer handbags. And so I said it as a joke and thought nothing of it. But a couple months later, I came across this article in the Washington Post that described a real life con artist who had created this seemingly foolproof counterfeit handbag scheme. Right. And when I read that, I thought, okay, this belongs in a novel. And that was kind of how it started. And yet the thing about that is uh, you set out to do a book that uh, did not require research, <laughs> but you did a remarkable amount of research, right? I mean, the, in, the, in the novel, the characters go to uh, this, this Chinese handbag, sort of it's a, a mall that, that has all these different models and to the, the, the places where they're, they're being made. You went there, right? You actually, yes. you did this. Yes, yes. So it, that's often how novels go. You, you know, you know they, they kind of take you down a path that you don't expect. And yes, yeah, so this novel did in, in, in the end require a lot of research. Um, and I was very lucky that I got a research grant that enabled me to go to Guangzhou in southern China and also to Hong Kong. Um, and so I visited the shopping malls where the fakes were sold, as you say. Um, I was really lucky that I got to visit a handbag factory that actually manufactures for um, international designer brands. Um, and then I also talked to um, an IP lawyer in Hong Kong who specializes in copyright infringement in China. And she had a really remarkable perspective that, um, and I don't think I could have written the book without any of that research. 
I bet, I bet. I just wanna remind everybody, please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A tab. Um, we'll be getting to those real soon and I, I wanna hear from as many of you as possible. So please uh, type in your questions and let us know where, where you're writing from as well. Um, I, I wanna ask you a little bit about visiting that handbag manufacturing facility in the in the book, you, the the character goes to, to two different ones. There's there's the 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 one that's you know for the designer brands, and then there's the knockoff one. And there's a significant difference in the working conditions in those two. Uh, it sounds like you actually went to the, the legit one, right? Uh, mm -hmm. How did it seem? Like what was that experience for, like for you? Yes, it would have been extremely difficult to visit a so-called black factory. I don't think that. Um, I personally could have gained access to it just because they're so secretive. They're constantly getting raided and shut down and rebuilding. And so um, that would have been extremely difficult to do. Although I did find some videos on YouTube of intrepid reporters who had managed to somehow get into some of these factories. So I did see a little bit of footage um, about that. No, the, the factory that I did visit was a completely legitimate um, state-of-the-art factory, very well-known manufacturers for a lot of international brands that you would all recognize. Um, and I think that really kind of hammered home for me just how we kind of paint with a very broad brush when we consider made in China to be inferior. You know, mm. there are state-of-the-art factories in China. Um, there are sweatshops in Los Angeles and New York um, yeah. and in Italy, which we consider the kind of creme de la creme of um, fashion manufacturing. Um, and I think the, um, the, the reality is so much more complicated than that. Yeah, and I mean, in fact, just the fact that they're even being made in China at all, right? I mean, these are brands that, you know, advertise it made in Italy, right? Yes. And that, that's that's not necessarily the, the truth. Maybe maybe the handle is made in, in Italy. <laughs> that was, yes, that was one of the most interesting things that I uncovered in my research is um, the lengths to which brands go to, some brands, not all, go to hide that they manufacture in China because of this broad perception. Again, like this was a really great, modern, clean factory that I visited. Um, and uh, when I was at the factory, I actually walked into a rack of designer handbags and my guide said, you cannot take a picture. <laughs> he said, tell no one you saw these and don't take a picture. And I kind of, we both laughed, but I mean, I think that kind of sums it up. It's sort yeah. of, um, it's funny because, you know, if you looked at the factory, there's nothing, you know, they, the brand should be very proud of doing their manufacturing there. Um, but yes, uh, the, the, um, the kind of um, dishonesty that you just alluded to with some brands, and this is what I uncovered when I was reading about this, um, some brands will manufacture an entire bag in China and then hide the kind of made in China label inside a pocket or in a lining, and then they'll have the handle made in Italy and emboss you know, made in Italy under yeah. the handle. And that's the only thing the buyer sees, the customer sees. Um, and that was just one of, you know, many things that that I learned over the course of my research. It's such a, a, a fascinating world that we, we get to delve into in the book and that you actually in real life delved into to writing it. So many more questions about that. I want to get to a uh, uh, first question from, from the audience. Um, one person says, I'm, I'm currently a creative writing major. How is it teaching and writing at the same time? Do your students ever give you ideas? Oh, that's I love that question. Um, I really love teaching creative writing. Um, do they give me ideas? They definitely inspire me. Um, and I think that um, because so much of my social circle revolves around published writers, there is a tendency to get a little bit jaded. You know, everybody has published a book or multiple books. And so, you know, um, nobody gets really excited about reviews because, you know, or, or you, for various accolades, because you always know somebody who it seems very normal in, in our social circle. And you always know somebody who's doing a little bit better than you right there. You can always look ahead. Um, and so teaching my students like it just reminds me how lucky I am to have this job, you know, how, mm. how few people actually get to do this for a living. Um, and they are, um, they're incredible just in terms of, um, in terms of what amazing writers they are. And so, yes, they inspire me all the time. Yeah. Is it, is it actually, is it tough to, to balance the, the, just your time? I mean, I can't, I mean, it takes a, 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 a ton yeah. of work to write a book and all, all, on top of that, you're, you're traveling, you're doing research, but then you have your responsibilities as a teacher as well. Is it hard to, to balance all that? 
Yes, it definitely is. I mean, I teach part time. And so, you know, I'm able to have control of my schedule in that way. And I'm very, very lucky in that way. Um, but yes, if I were teaching more than, say, two classes a semester, it definitely um, it definitely um, uh, would be difficult to balance the two. Yeah. One person says, uh, asks if, if you like to travel for your research and, and, and says that that must be so fun to, to do that. Is that is that something you enjoy or is it feel like work or? Yeah, I mean, it's not a vacation, yeah. but I but I do love it. And I think um, one thing that I noticed about the travel is uh, the research travel that I do is um, I always take copious notes when I when I travel for research um, and I write everything down and then. I almost always never look at that notebook because when I get back to my computer in San Francisco and start writing, um, the images that stick with me are just so, it's so clear to me what needs to be in the book that mm -hmm. I often never, you know, I'll refer to like check a price or check a, you know, make sure that I have a specific detail, but, um, but um, you know, the, 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 the things that I see that need to make into the book are remarkably clear. Yeah. Yeah, they sort of stay with, you know, I, yeah. someone once told me uh, when I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, a journalist and that when I come back from doing a story and someone says, how was it? The, the first thing I tell them, like the, the thing that's sort of top of mind, you know, like, oh, you never believe this thing happened, even if it's not like what I went to cover. Like right. that's, the, that's actually the story, right? There's things that we just sort of internalize are, are kind of the, the great little nuggets that, that really need to be in there. Yes, exactly, exactly. A real, you know, a, an example that just like stands out to me is when I went to visit this gigantic shopping mall in Guangzhou, where all of these fake handbags are sold. And um, to some of uh, those of you listening that have not seen this, um, in Guangzhou, these fake handbags are sold out in the open in these giant shopping malls, yeah. just like legitimate merchandise. You know, it's like going, it's a brightly lit, air conditioned, clean shopping mall. Um, but when I showed up at the entrance, there was a police kiosk right outside. And there was a young policeman smoking a cigarette outside. And it was this juxtaposition because obviously, um, even though it's out in the open, it is illegal. And from time to time, there are, there are police raids and, you know, mm -hmm. people get arrested and businesses get shut down. Um, and it was that kind of paradox that was so interesting and that really kind of captured um, what it is I was trying to do in this novel. You know, there, there's just something about the, you know, this really made me think about designer handbags and knockoffs in a way that I never have before. <laughs> um, and I think it raises all these questions about val what, we, what we value, right? Because the, the designer, you know, th these aren't just like, you know, cheap knockoffs. These are like perfect replica bags mm -hmm. that the characters are selling. Uh, and in fact, I, oh, I should say we, we should be, we need to be careful not to have too many uh, people haven't necessarily all read the book, so I'm going to try to talk about this without any spoilers. And, yes. and, and, and the, please try not to do any spoilers in the questions too, as you're writing. But like, their scheme involves perfect replicas, mm -hmm. um, and in that case, it's sort of like, to me, why is the real thing more valuable than a perfect replica? Why do we? Why, why is one of them worth? A fortune, and the other one is is worth a, f a fraction of that, just based on it being real. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the the questions that I was really interested in exploring. I mean, um, this kind of um, really high end fake handbag that you're discussing, the, the term for it in um, the term in, in China that they use is super fake, right. and the technical definition of that is that it's ninety eight percent. It has to be at least ninety eight percent identical to the real thing, which is like that in and of itself is a little absurd. Like, how do you calculate that? Like, what does it mean? You know, if it's ninety eight percent. Um, you know, if one thing is 99.9% the same as, as the, the real, then what is real and what is fake? Um, I think a lot of experts will say um, that sometimes it, with these very high-end superfix, the difference is a serial number that the brands embed in a handbag just so that they themselves can track, you know, what the they need. It's consumer. Made. It's like, I mean, <laughs> yes. I, the bag itself is a status symbol, right? And so yes. if, you, if you have the real thing, then you have more status than a fake thing, of course. But it's like, it, it, unlike like an art forgery, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the bag has a utility, I guess. But maybe I'm maybe I'm thinking about bags wrong. No, I think you're thinking about bags right. And actually, you know, writing this book made me think about how much 
other things in our lives kind of work this way, except that we give them a kind of inherent value. Like I was thinking a lot about a college education and, you know, we've seen all these, uh, or maybe not, but, you know, recently in the news, I've listened, uh, I've come across all these studies that show that if you track high school students that say got into Harvard, um, high school students that got into Harvard and then a, a certain percentage of them go to Harvard and a certain percentage of them decide to go to a state school that costs less. Yeah. And then 10 years later, you come back and see where they are. Oftentimes those two cohorts of students are equally successful. Yeah. And so what that would indicate to us is that it's the student, not necessarily the school that is right. Yeah. And so we all know that. And yet many, many of us would say, still, you should go to Harvard <laughs> because it's Harvard. And so what is the value of Harvard, right? Like that's kind of, yeah. in some ways, the same question. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> I have so many more questions for you, but we have a ton of great questions coming in from the audience. I'm going to jump to uh, one from Olivia who says, um, in Counterfeit, uh, she says, I should explain for people who haven't read uh, the book yet, the, the first part of the book, um, the narrator uh, is, is or is one of the characters and is speaking to a detective, right? So she says, why didn't the detective ask Ava any questions throughout her lengthy story? I, I thought it seemed strange that the detective just sat there and listened to all the minute details without saying anything. I think I'm thinking that maybe we're just not getting the, the detective's questions. And in fact, it's not just a, a monologue, but that, that's my take on it. What, what Can you talk about, about writing it from that perspective of it being narrated in, in a way to a, a police detective. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the confession form is one that has always interested me because yeah. um, it is just a really, uh, you know, the character has just such clear motivations because if you're in a confessional format, the character has, you know, one goal, which is either to lessen their sentence, to go free, to prove their innocence. And so that kind of really goal oriented um, uh, narrative was interesting to me. Um, I think I, um, in terms of the back and forth of the detective, um, I do think that uh, it is an interesting strategy to just let somebody talk. And I think a lot of, you know, in, in, in the course of my research, um, a lot of very uh, effective um, interrogators do that to just kind of let somebody talk themselves into, uh, into a mess really. And, and, and I think that that is, in my mind, the strategy that the detective is taking. But yes, she does um, increasingly push back over, um, over the course of the narrative. But because of the um, narrative strategy, which is a confession, um, and is uh, essentially a mo monologue for about, say, 60 to 70 percent of the book, yeah. um, I didn't want to break it up by having, um, you know, a back and forth with the detective. And so really, and you, it's you just switched kind of, to a third person narrator. Yes. You know, it, was that how, how was that? Did, was it, did it feel different to suddenly be writing? I don't know if you write a book beginning. Actually, this is kind of a question. Is, is, do you write a book from the beginning to end? Do you, do you are you moving? Around? I mean, there's a lot of revisions, but like at some point, you switch to a third person. I'm just wondering if yes. that, suddenly it felt different writing that way. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, to give your um, to give the audience a kind of overview, the the part one of the book is uh, the main character Ava Wong uh, confessing a crime to a detective, and then in part two we get to hear from Winnie, who was her accomplice. Um, and you know, when I first started working on this book, I actually wanted to write the entire thing as a confession. Mm -hmm. I wanted the whole thing to be a monologue. Um, and I thought there was something really kind of tight and elegant about that structure. But what I quickly figured out was that I could not tease out um, the nuances of Ava's unreliability. I could not show um, when was she lying, when was she exaggerating, when was she telling the truth, right? It was too, it got too complicated. Um, and so that was when I realized, okay, I need to bring in another voice that is the kind of story of record, the kind of objective, quote unquote, objective narrative. Um, and that was when I brought in Winnie's voice. And it was really fun, to your question, it was really fun to do because I think the two women are um, very much opposites. Um, Ava is this kind of straight laced, rule abiding, uh, typical model minority. Um, and then Winnie is kind of very bold and confident and, and brash and decisive. And so um, it was nice to be able to show both of their voices. You know, you, you used uh, the, the term model minority again, and we have a question about that that I also wanted to really ask you about. Um, this person says, can you talk more about shattering the myth of mm. the model minority? Why was that important? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, so just to give, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with the term, but just to give like a kind of very brief um, overview. Um, the model minority myth is this idea um, that um, mainly East Asian immigrants in East Asia, uh, East Asian Americans um, are kind of um, submissive, polite, uh, hardworking, and also that they've achieved a certain level of success um, due to that hard work. And I think many people ask, or some people ask, well, you know, that sounds very positive. Like, why is that a problem? Um, but, you know, it is a problem for a couple of reasons. And one is that it pits people of color against each other, because yeah. oftentimes a certain, you know, if East Asians are held up as, uh, as an example in order to kind of shame other people of color to say, well, if they can do it, why can't you do it? So that's one problem. Um, another problem is that um, if you are a model minority, then you are inherently held apart from the rest of society. And so East Asians are often in a position of having to continually prove that they are actually American. Um, yeah. And we've seen that in countless examples. Um, in recent examples, for example, when um, Asian Americans were uh, accused of perpetuating the Chinese flu. That would be an example of um, you know, them being kind of singled out as foreigners. Um, and so that's just kind of a, a quick overview. Um, and I think that for me, um, that was re that's really the heart of the book. You know, was about these two women who, on the surface, um, look like model minorities, and uh, and everybody thinks that they they know exactly who they are based on um, their accomplishments and their appearance and their mannerisms and um, the ways in which they um, subvert and um, ultimately overthrow that myth. Uh, what is really um, what I was interested in exploring. Yeah, great. You know, we, have, we have a question from Sarah who says, I love the cover art. How did this come about? I'm going to hold it up so everybody yes. can see it. And, and, and I completely agree with her. It's absolutely beautiful. She wants to know how, how that came about and, and uh, what, the, what the story behind the art is. I really love the cover art too. So I'm so glad that it's resonated with readers. Um, I um, worked with a wonderful artist who, um, I, I believe it started with the art director at William Morrow. She um, found this artist um, and we looked at her portfolio and we just really, she's known for this kind of wallpaper background. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we wanted the cover to be, um, what are some, some of the words that we were, was kind of off kilter if that makes sense. Like, yeah. you know, I think that it's almost a cliche to have um, a, a, a book with a woman's face on the cover. Like that's a very common image. Yeah. And so we wanted it to feel special and a little bit off. Like, you know, for somebody to look at that and be like, okay, that's not yeah. a, something I've necessarily seen before. And interestingly, um, a, you know, the sales team actually thought it was too busy and um, really? they kept encouraging us to kind of stream. And I will say early drafts were much busier. If you can imagine there were more details than wow. this. Um, yeah. And they kept encouraging us to streamline. And I really credit my editor for saying like, you know, it is the busyness that makes it interesting. Yeah. And I um, completely agree. Do you as an author have much say in that kind of thing? It really depends. It really yeah. depends. I mean, the short answer is no, they don't have to consult me at all. Um, the long answer is um, I was very lucky to have a team that really wanted me involved and that really um, solicited my input at every stage. Of, I saw count, yeah. many, many drafts of the cover before we finally picked one. Um, but that is really um, the generosity on their mm -hmm. part. How about drafts of the book? I mean, what's, you know, having never written a novel, it sounds like it can be pretty hard to actually get over the finish line. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think for me, I probably wrote um, 10 full drafts on my own from start to finish over the years, you know, and that's that's pretty normal. That's a normal number of drafts for me. I, I think I'm someone who... Um, when you, when you start a new draft, are you just starting from the beginning and writing all over again, or are you- I do. I, I start with a blank Word document every time nice. because, and, and this is some of my students are, have the same face you have right now, okay? Uh, but, you know, I actually find that really helpful because I think um, with each draft, I want to recommit to each line that I've already written, you know? And so like, instead of, if I started cutting and pasting, it would be too difficult to actually cut anything because it looks pretty good. <laughs> the words are pretty good. But if I have to make myself type out a line over again and I hear it internally, then I'm saying, yes, that was exactly That's what it. I wanted to say. 
And so it's the only way I revise is to start over. Um, yes, when it gets to the end and when we're just tweaking, I, I don't start from a blank document again, but when I'm still in the conceptual phase, blank word document 10 times. And then, you know, I was so lucky to have a really, really meticulous editor. Jessica Williams is my editor at Morrow. And she pushed me harder than I've ever been pushed. And uh, these last kind of five, maybe four drafts that we worked on together were um, some of the some of the hardest, um, most taxing work that I've ever done as a writer. And I remember like maybe like the second to last draft. Um, I was on the phone with her and I said to her, Jessica, I, I think this might be the best I can do. And she said, Kirsten, try one more time, just oh. one more time. And I did. And uh, we were already late. You know, the book was due in June and it was, or we thought we'd be done in June. It was already August, but she was just, she's a perfectionist and what a gift for an author, because I'm so grateful that we did one more draft. And I mean, you know, she, the, the book was probably pretty good, but she made it even better. And thanks to her. <laughs> wow. I, it sounds like a curse, not a gift to me, but that's, <laughs> but it paid off because the book works, yeah. right? So, and, yeah. and, and, and you're happier with the last draft yes. than you were with the first. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And it, it is, a lot of it is chemistry. I don't think every writer works the way that I do and wants that kind of relationship. But for me, it is a privilege. <laughs> you know, one one person is asking us to go back in time, and we've been talking a lot about counterfeit. But of course, you've got two novels before then. Uh, this person asked, "What inspired your first novel, and how did you get into writing?" Um, that's somebody from California asking, um, and that was uh, soy sauce for beginners, right? Mm -hmm. How did uh, what inspired that? Yeah. Also, another seemingly random topic, Soy Sauce for Beginners is a novel that is set in contemporary Singapore, which is where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, and it's centered around a family business that is an artisanal soy sauce factory that's um, the last of its kind and fighting to stay alive. Um, it's interesting where ideas come from because they, they really come from everywhere. Um, you know, when I started that novel, I was an MFA student at Emerson College in Boston. Um, and um, all I knew when I started that book was that I wanted to write about a character who was searching for home, which is a very, very vague idea. <laughs> and she's somebody who's moved away, built a life away from home, and now various circumstances bring her back home. Um, and I remember my uh, professor, Lisa Haynes, saying to me, uh, but what, what work does she do? Like, you have to give her a job. And I thought, like, oh, it's Singapore, I'm not a soy sauce. Soy sauce. I'll, I'll just pick soy sauce as a placeholder. And then, as with the handbags, I started doing research into soy sauce factories and got deeper and deeper and learned that, you know, not all soy sauce is the same. And some of it is commercial and some of it is artisanal. And the artisanal, um, soy sauce businesses, a lot of them are going out of business because they aren't valued. And so, as you can see, I kind of got, went down this path and um, the soy sauce factory ended up being a, a great metaphor for the story. And um, also to this day, the only book I've read about a soy sauce factory. So I think there's that too. I, I can add that I also have not read any other books <laughs> about soy sauce factories. Right. So you, you definitely got new ground there. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a, a ton of great questions and I'd like to invite everybody to ask more. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to, uh, to get to your questions as well. Just wanna take a quick break. My, my colleague, Sandy Chin is joining us now to share a special offer with everybody. Uh, hey, Sandy. Hi, Craig. Hello to everyone at home. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's summer reading edition of Beyond the Page featuring New York Times best-selling author, Kirsten Chen. Think for a moment about all the ways GBH keeps you informed. You hear the news of the day in all its nuance. You also hear deep dives into books, art, music, movies, and science, and everything else that makes our lives richer. And none of this happens without member support. And it's why your contribution is so important. So tonight, if you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer, that's only $60 a year, we'll send you a signed copy of Kirsten's latest novel, Counterfeit. And for fans of Hustlers and How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, this story of two Asian American women 
banding together to grow a counterfeit handbag scheme into a global enterprise is an incisive and glittering blend of fashion, crime, and friendship. And this book is the June 2022 Reese's Book Club pick that has also been recommended, as Craig said earlier, by the New York Times, the Washington Post, People Magazine, Entertainment Weekly, Time, Oprah Daily, Harper's Bazaar, really the list goes on, Cosmopolitan, Good Housekeeping, Parade, and more. There's no better time to give than now. And all you need to do is visit gbh.org slash support events, or go ahead and send a text to 800-204-3811 using the keyword GBH to donate, or scan the QR code here to open a donation form on your smartphone or device. And thank you. We'll send you a signed copy of Counterfeit. And out of all the news and entertain, entertainment sources out there, you turn to GBH. And that's why we're turning to you to ask for your support. Happy summer reading, everyone. And now back to Craig with more of your questions. I need, to, I need to unmute myself. I don't know if I was muted there. Um, I just wanted to agree with Sandy. It's absolutely a, a super fun read and, and thoroughly enjoying it. Um, we have, uh, uh, and, and, and you can get it, as she said, um, and by, by making a donation to GBH now, and that donation helps support events like this and, and the work we do uh, here at GBH, journalism and all kinds of uh, programming. So thank you for your support. Um, I wanna get to another question here from, from one of our viewers asks what your advice is for a young woman wanting to pursue writing as a career. Oh, yeah. Um, it's hard to make um, a kind of blanket uh, statement about this, but I will say broadly, um, if anybody is interested in um, uh, pursuing writing, I mean, I think the number one thing that I, I um, tell my students, for example, is that um, very few things are universal about writers, like almost all of us have our own writing process, our own path, our own journey, except for the fact that every successful writer I know is a reader, first mm. and foremost. Um, and so I think that is very important. I don't know a writer, I've never come across a writer who doesn't love to read. And so I would say, read broadly, read, uh, read a lot, read, read what you enjoy, like don't feel like you have to like only read the classics or only read the Russians, you know, read broadly and you're in good shape. Um, I think um, community is really, really important. You know, not everybody wants or needs an MFA. I happen to have gotten one and um, it, that was um, essential to me becoming a writer, but many, many successful writers don't get an MFA. But I think that community is really important, whether you're, um, you know, joining um, a workshop that you find online or um, a community, um, you know, in Boston, for instance, Grub Street is a great uh, mm. uh, community resource. Um, and so I think finding like-minded people who are trying to do the same thing is, uh, will serve you well for your entire writing life. Um, and then really paying attention to who your uh, readers are going to be, because um, I lean on my uh, early readers a lot. Uh, I could not be the writer that I am without them. And so, um, paying attention when you're, you know, when you are exchanging work with people, paying attention to the people who really get you as a writer, the people that you really enjoy talking to, the people whose feedback really resonates. Um, uh, and when you find those people, you know, hold them close. That's great. You know, you talked about the importance of being a good reader. Um, and I've, I've heard that you, you had a, a great love of reading from a very young age and it didn't necessarily always <laughs> serve you academically actually, right? Yes, that's right. You know, I've oh, for as long as I can remember, I've loved to read since I was a little, little kid. Um, and I grew up in Singapore, which has, um, as some of you may know, a really um, exemplary public school system that is also extremely high pressure. Um, and so from the first grade, we were taking midterms and finals and tests. If you can imagine, I think back and I don't know how, how that was possible at, at the age of six or seven, but it's true. We all did it. So it's true. And we, and I, I believe they still they still do it. So um, so millions of people have done it. Um, and um, in my classroom, the rule was once you finish your test, you can bring a book in your backpack and you can once you turn in your test, you can take out your book and read it. And I would be 
always in the middle of a book that I was so excited to read that I would kind of race through the test um, just in order to have time to read. And my grades were really bad because sometimes I would leave off the last page. I just wouldn't turn the test over. I would just kind of be so happy to be done that I would just like turn in the paper and, and take my book. Um, and my poor mom had to kind of sit me down and she was like, walk me through the process. Why is this happening? Yeah. <laughs> I know you know this, this stuff. Yeah, she's like, how could it be that you just left the last page off? And when I explained to her, she realized what was happening. And she had to say very sadly, I'm sorry, you can't take a book to class anymore. Um, and um, unfortunately, my grades improved after she did that. <laughs> no, no more reading during <laughs> no exam. No more reading, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but but at least uh, you know you had that passion that spark early on, and and clearly it served you, right? I mean, it's you know if if you hadn't been such a voracious reader even at, at such a young age, and I think it's uh, as as a as a, a parent of a toddler myself, you know, it's it's an inspiration that we need to. Uh, I don't know. Actually, here's a, can, can I instill that, or is it on? Is it is it something that's in him? I mean, I think reading is just inherently fun. Yeah. I think I agree, and we read to him constantly. I just yeah. don't know if, like, if, <laughs> if he's going to take to it, or or if it, you know, if if uh, if there are things that I can do. I'm not an expert, so I'll leave that. To, right. to... I'm just, just. We actually we have a question about parenting, though, because uh, so this one person, although this question actually has some spoilers, uh, and uh, so I'm going to uh, edit how I say it, which is in in the book. Uh, one of the main characters uh, is it Ava or Ava, by the way? Ava. Okay, it's when you read a book, you don't know. You say it over it's and over. True. And you you say it how saying you it say the right it. way? Am I saying it the wrong? <laughs> and the other name has a child name. I believe it would be pronounced Henri because it's H E N R I, right? I say Henry because he's. You do say I Henry. figured. Well, I figure he's in the Bay Area. Who's really going to call him Henri? <laughs> but his but his dad is French, right? Yes, but his dad does. Call, yes, yes. Okay, so so anyway, the, the question is about uh, some of his delays uh, initially that, that he and um, that he, and he has he has tantrums and 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 he has uh, kind of a hard time um, initially, but it, it improves. And and the question from um, it's Alicia wants to know what your motivation was for for adding that storyline of of what she was going through, uh, what, what uh, it was going through with her son and what and what her son was was working to overcome at a young age. Yeah, yeah. Um... I was really interested um, in exploring what happens when a character like Ava, who, her, who has been so in control of her entire life, what happens when someone like her becomes a parent? Because as many of you know, you cannot control your child's temperament or personality or whether they sleep, right? Like that stuff just is kind of luck of the draw. And I think I was thinking about what would be the hardest thing for Ava to deal with? And that was my answer because, you know, she can control how she appears to the world. She can control her own behavior. She can even control her emotions because she's had so much practice doing it, but she can't control her child. Um, and so that was kind of the motivation for that. Um, and then um, Henry is a character. I mean, he, he grew to charm me, even despite his, you know, despite he, you know, he is, he has tantrums and he um, is a fussy child, um, but he's also, he also has moments of sweetness and like, yeah. like all children, you know, yeah. he's, he has both. Um, and so um, I hope that, you know, I hope he comes across as a complex character in his own right. Yeah, I'd say he does. And, <laughs> and, and I mean, there's, again, as, as a parent of a toddler, uh, there was there was a certain amount of relief here reading what what's possible and knowing okay I I don't have it that bad at all you know <laughs> like, and, and also that um I never had to go through uh the 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 preschool interview that the characters yes. does. it sounds like I guess that's a real thing uh it is at least in the bay area but I think you know I've talked to other people who have said it, it happens in many places so I think that that is um I believe that's true to life yes so stressful <laughs> So stressful. <laughs> uh, so uh, one one person says, uh, "Amazing to hear about all these drafts that you do from scratch." I found that amazing too. Um, this person asks, "How long did each one take, and uh, how much did you find carries through from the first draft?" Oh yeah. Okay. So um, each draft probably takes a couple of months. I mean, it kind of depends how much I'm trying to. Let me back up a little. I think with each draft, I try not to solve 
every problem at once because that would be impossible. So oftentimes there's an overarching thing that I'm trying to do with each draft. And this is gonna sound very basic, but with draft one, the only question I'm trying to answer is, is this idea a novel? <laughs> Meaning, is this an idea that can carry 300 pages, 200 pages, or should it be a short story or should it be nothing and I should just delete it, right? So that's the, that's the only question I'm trying to answer with draft one. With draft two, I'm probably thinking about, okay, now that, now that I know uh, that this is a novel, who are the characters? What is the voice of these characters? And that's the only thing I'm trying to do in draft two. And then in draft three, maybe I'm starting to think about plot and, you know, so I, I kind of, I guess what I'm saying is- referring to the other drafts? Like, okay, what happens next? Or is it just so, it's so in you that, that you can just do it basically from memory? Uh, no, I refer to, so I have, okay. I usually print out the draft and put it beside me. And then, and then yes, if you want the technical details, that's yeah, what I do. I, I just think yeah. it's a fascinating process. Yeah. Um, and well, I'm glad you think that. To me, it sounds kind of tedious and mundane, but. <laughs> well, you know, it sounds fascinating and tedious. Actually. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. That is probably how it is. Yes. And then, you know, so with the fourth draft, it might just be, okay, is the point of view, like, am I doing what do I want to do with point of view? Like, I mean, that might be the kind of specific overarching question. But then obviously, as I'm answering that question, you're fixing things as you go along. Um, I just try to have a focus so that it doesn't overwhelm me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say it takes a couple of months for each draft. I mean, each book probably takes me um, th three to five years before um, I find my publisher. And then um, with my, pub my editor at a publishing house, we'll work on it for another year together. Um, so it's a long, it's a long process. Yeah, it's a commitment for sure. Yeah. Are you working on one book at a time or do you already, are you starting drafts or thinking about ideas for your next book as you're writing one? For me, I kind of have tunnel vision uh, with each book. I kind of just start working on it and then I just, I can't think about anything else. Like it, mm. I'm, I'm not a multitasker. That is just, I think that's my nature. Um, so I just, pick a thing and follow it to the end. But that's why it's so important to know upfront that this is a novel. The first question I asked, is this a novel? You know, I need to know that because if not, I've just wasted a couple of years. And I have very good first readers who will tell me if I, you know, who I trust deeply, who will say like, yes, you're on the right path or yes, you can make this work. Um, the other interesting thing that uh, since, uh, since Craig, you're so interested in process, uh, one detail that might interest you is that um, when I'm drafting, I actually stick to a very, very regimented schedule. Um, and I try to draft a thousand words a day. And my writing partner and I have this system where we exchange a thousand words over email every day, five days a week or six days a week, however often we're writing at the time. Um, and then we'll give each other a thumbs up or thumbs down, no wow. comments. And the idea is Thumbs up means keep going. Thumbs down means go back and revise those thousand words. And it's a system that has really ended up working for us. And I think um, part of the reason is because, because we don't comment on each other's work. We don't get in the weeds. Um, because I think with the first it's draft, just, that's, that's the full that's comment. It. I mean, we type thumbs up <laughs> or thumbs down. Yes. Not even just more than an emoji. Cause we started this back in the day when you couldn't send emojis so it's and if you get a thumbs down are you just furious at that person no because uh no because the stakes are so low you yeah. know he's he my my writing partner is the wonderful writer Matthew Salisis who so, some of you may know he also has a Boston connection because we went to grad school together um mm -hmm. but the stakes are low because we're only talking about the previous thousand words so the worst case is you go back and revise one day of work um and uh I, to me it is a really effective drafting strategy as if, <laughs> as long as you can get past that one day, if you, if, if, you know, if you get stuck, it can be. Yes, uh, but yes. But I mean, the other thing is that we're not extremely, um, you know, we, we don't try to be very critical because again, it's the first draft, right? Yeah. The idea is just, was this good enough to build on tomorrow? Okay. And it's remarkable. You can write a whole book in a thousand word chunks. <laughs> All right. You just need a good partner. For sure. Yes. You need the um, right partner. You have to have the right chemistry. <laughs> we have a great question here, uh, which is as you write or edit, do you ever consider how your story or characters would translate on the movie screen? And, and along those lines, I think it's important to say that uh, Counterfeit has been picked up by Sony Pictures for the television rights. Is that right? That's right. It's been optioned. Yes. Um, as I'm writing, I never think about that. 
<laughs> Part of it might be because this is the first time I've ever been optioned. And so I didn't even, you know, didn't really know that it was a possibility. Yeah. Um, and also because they seem like pretty different genres in my mind. And so I don't, you know, I don't naturally kind of, my mind doesn't, I know some people say they can see the scenes in their head and they're extremely visual in the way that they're, they write. And I'm not really that way. And so perhaps that's, you know, that might be one of the reasons as well. Um, but yes, uh, this, um, the, the television rights got optioned shortly after um, I found my publisher. So very, very early in the process, um, which was interesting um, because um, I was, you know, talking to um, producers and studio execs as I was revising the book. Wow. Um, so you, it wasn't even a finished Pu uh, published book yet or, no you know. no 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 it was way way um in the beginning of so i you know i sold the book to my publisher in um november of 2020 and i think the tv rights were optioned in january of 2021 so they saw mm -hmm. the draft yeah um that that went to my editor um which was quite different from the, the book that exists today um but interestingly, because I was talking to producers and because producers think in terms of seasons, you know, television, they, they, they were thinking in t uh, of a TV series and, and season one, season two, and they were already projecting ahead. Um, I wonder if, um, while I wasn't uh, explicitly imagining my story on screen, I was thinking a little bit ahead. And so, you know, those of you that have read the book will see that there are some threads that are kind of looking toward the future. Um, okay. And I think... And I wonder if I fleshed those out a little bit more than I would have had I not already known the rights were optioned. How how does that work? I mean, they will will someone else write the TV scripts? Do you have any creative control over a, a TV series? I mean, and and I mean, will they will they take this and chop it up into seasons? Like, I mean, it's it's such a it's it's a very clear story arc. It doesn't it doesn't. I, I can't yeah. imagine where I would end the season. <laughs> yes. So I, again, I'm not an expert, but what I'm told is that a novel is uh, often a season one kind of thing, a six yeah. to 10 limited series. So not a network series that has like, I don't know, 30 episodes, six to 10 episodes is kind mm -hmm. of a perfect novel, uh, the perfect length of a novel kind of corresponds to that's what I'm told from produce, uh, from the producers I've spoken to and I'm working with. Um, uh I was asked if I wanted to do the adaptation and I have to, or if I wanted to be involved in the adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say that the idea did not really appeal to me. Really? Uh, I think, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, I really put my soul into this book, you know, especially at the end when I was, when my editor kind of carried me across the line, like I kind of bled for this book. And I think to have to do the adaptation would be like, bleeding a second time, except this time I have to convince 20 other people that the way that I'm doing it is the right way. Um, and I think that would be really stressful. Um, and also I think, you know, I've never done an adaptation, so I would have to learn a new genre of writing and perhaps my time is best served working on another book. But is it tough to kind of give up the creative control? I mean, this is your story, this is your baby and, and you're yeah. putting it out there and then someone else is gonna make it into their own thing. Yeah, no, it's true. You know, I was just talking to um, another writer, Angie Kim, who wrote a wonderful book, Miracle Creek. I, I saw her in DC when I was on my book tour and she had some really great advice because her she's going through this with her book as well. And she said, somebody told her that your novel is your baby and the TV adaptation is your grandkids. <laughs> so drop in and do the fun stuff. And then when it gets difficult, hand it back to them. <laughs> All yours. Okay, that's great. <laughs> yeah. I love that. That's terrific. Um, one uh, viewer wants to know, uh, how many tries did it take to get your first story accepted for publication? Oh, yeah. Gosh, I can remember that first story. The first, you know, I remember the first story I got accepted. I remember the first novel, you know, the yep. moment that I sold the word. You never forget that. Never. Yeah, big moment. Um, yeah, big moment. Um, the first story that I ever published was in graduate school. That didn't take that long because I didn't aim super high, I think, you know, like um, it was early to, uh, 2006 around and there were a lot of kind of new um, online magazines that were uh, around and I found one that had an affiliation with my graduate program so I didn't 
send it to the New Yorker or anything like that. Um, so that happened relatively quickly. I will say that for my first novel, it took a really long time to sell. Um, the book um, was on submission for a total of eight months before somebody found, finally bought it. And in that time, um, my agent sent it out to 19 editors, all of them rejected it. Um, two of the 19 asked for revision. So we pulled it back and I spent a few months revising. We sent it back to those two editors, both of them rejected it. So we had to start over. I mean, this is a kind of com it's a it's a kind of common tale. Um, but it did take long enough that my agent and I had to sit down and discuss what would we do if the book never sold? Would I move on? You know, so it was a tough, a really, really tough time. Um, mm. And then, you know, at the end of those eight months, the 20th editor we sent it to bought it. And uh, that was really, you know, it was a great lesson as a writer mm. that um, that the publishing process is so separate from the writing process. It was yeah. the same book that was rejected 19 times yeah. that, um, you know, was bought on the 20th try and nothing, all of that had nothing to do with me. Um, and so I try to, I try to remember that, you know, um, to this day. Yeah. I mean, it's just re remarkable perseverance. You just, you, you could have given up. You could have said, you know what? Writing books is not for me. You yeah. know, this is your first one. And, and um, I, I, I bet actually probably a lot of people do exactly that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I took up meditation. That's what I did because I knew <laughs> I would not survive in this industry if I, um, if I let the kind of roller coaster carry me, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that has helped throughout uh, your career. Uh, another person asks, uh, says, I'm curious, uh, how soon Kirsten picked the name when writing the novel? Such a fitting title. That's actually oh. a great, that's a great point, right? I mean, it's, yeah. the, it's the perfect name. It's one word. It sums it all up, but it's also kind of, it, it talks about the people. I mean, it, there's, a, there's a lot in the name. Yeah, to be honest, that name was the, the title was the working title. So from the first draft that I wrote, I just put counterfeit on the top because I couldn't think of anything else. Yeah. And I kept saying to myself, I'll, I'll think of a better title when it when the time comes. And at each stage, everyone really liked the title. So I sent it to my first reader. They were like, yeah, it's good enough. Sent it to my agent. She was like, yeah, it's good enough. Sent it to my publisher. We had a real conversation because the word is so common that it's mm -hmm. not very searchable, which is something that people pay a lot of attention to yeah. now. But we couldn't think of anything that worked on as many levels, that was clear, that was memorable. Um, and so in the end, we kept it. It made it, it past worked. every stage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It just worked. It's just <laughs> interesting to think about how, how you know, uh, how this, the process works. And that's a, that's yeah. a big part of it. What are you going to call your book? Um, that's super interesting. You know, one of the things I was wondering about was both of the main characters reflect on the 2016 election. And, and it actually changed, you know, the way they, they thought about where they lived and, and what they were doing and do they want to be in this country? And, and, um, and I just, I just wanted to ask, I mean, you, you wrote the book actually in 2020. So it was another interesting time. I, I actually started in 2017 though, 2017, right after the election. Yeah, it, was, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was what it was uh, picked up. Sold by in 2020. Yes. Yeah. But I'm just wondering about like, about that choice and and um, why that was important as as a as a key moment, uh, the act, the election for for both of these characters and and if you think that has you know larger implications for Asian Americans, Asian American women. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I I firstly those were issues that were very much on my mind. You know, somebody asked why why was the model minority myth so, such so front and center on my mind and and the honest answer is because of the election. Um, uh, where do I start with that? I mean, I think um, I grew up in Singapore and I am Singaporean. And so um, prior to 2016, and this is not something that I'm proud of, but prior to 2016, I thought of politics as a spectator sport because I don't vote because again, I'm Singaporean. Um, uh, okay. And so uh, when that election happened, I realized how uh, naive and privileged my position was. And 
that I needed to think concretely about what kind of country I wanted to live in and that I had to participate in that process. Even if I'm not voting, mm -hmm. I, am respons I have responsibility and I'm complicit. And so I think that election made me think con in kind of a, a paradoxical way. It made me feel American for the first time. Hmm. And so, um, and so I was, you know, I was thinking about what does it mean to be a person of uh, color in America, a woman of color, an Asian American woman, and um, my characters are, you know, in that sense, like me, you know. And so um, Winnie is from China, and she's made a choice to live in America. And um, when that, ha when the election happens, she thinks mm -hmm. like, well, you know. I'm from somewhere else, is it time to just go back? And I think a lot of uh, expats and uh, recent immigrants had that question because you know they hadn't had maybe enough time to put down their roots in America yet. Um, and then um, Ava, on the other hand, has lived her whole life trying to assimilate, um, trying to uh, be the person that the, that that she believes will make her a valued member of society. And then she, and, and the election also, uh, you know, makes her start to question that as many people, um, as many people did and are doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, we have uh, uh, time for just a couple more quick questions. Um, we have one from Susan, I, I, I like this. She says, I'm in a book club and I wonder what you think are the most important points to consider for an outstanding book to, to talk about in a book club. Oh, do you mean for uh, just in general? I think so. I think that yeah, she's she's. I think she's asking you know for for recommendations. How do we choose a great book to to talk oh. about? That's my interpretation <laughs> of her question. How do you choose a great? That is so difficult because I find yeah. reading to be so personal. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's but that's also part of the thing about being in a book club, right? It's a personal thing, and yet like. The, a book club is a communal experience. Yes, that's true. And I will say that, uh, you know, oftentimes when you're pushed out of your comfort zone, you find books that you don't necessarily, you know, uh, oftentimes I've found that the books that end up teaching me the most in my own writing are often books that I did not think would be in any way related to what I was working on. So yes, I could see and that. And yet you read those books, right? I mean, I guess maybe, maybe the question is sort of like, how do you discover new, new books to read? Yeah, I mean, sure. I um, I'm lucky that I am surrounded by voracious readers, um, and so um, we're constantly recommending books to each other. And then also because I'm surrounded by a lot of writers, sometimes you'll say I'm working on a particular problem, and they'll say, "Oh, you should read this." <laughs> you know, if you're working on unreliable narrators, have you read this? Or if you're working on historical fiction, this is a great book. Um, and my students as well do that because um, they, you know, a lot of them have taste that is uh, different from mine. Yeah. Um, Yes. So that's great. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Just yeah, just listening to the the, the opinions of people who uh, have different perspectives and, yes. and whose opinions you respect. That's great. Yes. I want to ask you, of course, about you know what's next for you. You know, do you have 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 you started that that uh, first draft yet in in the in the next one, or maybe it's not a novel. Maybe you're doing something different. What 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 uh, what's planned? Uh, yeah, I try to kind of be always working on a new book just for my uh, peace of mind, and you know, it kind of just. Um, helps you to have perspective and it doesn't feel like everything is riding on the book that you're currently promoting or the book that your most recent book. And so I try to always be working on something. Um, I'm working on a very different novel. Um, the working title is Control and it is set in the dirty cutthroat world of pediatric cancer research. <laughs> and it's really? set in it's set in an elite cancer research lab um, at a Harvard-like institute, and um, I kind of pitch it as Succession with Nerds. Okay, <laughs> that is going to be another huge success. I'm we'll sure see. It's a little that. bit more. It's another very niche topic, so we'll. we'll I'm, I'm glad you approve. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I can't wait. I will be the first to to, to race out to the bookstore and grab that one. Well, Kirsten, this has been so much fun. I'm sorry that we actually are out of time. This is, uh, you know, we I, I could ask, I could talk to you all night long. Um, and and then there's actually, I'm sorry to the, the people who have asked questions that we didn't get a chance to get to. There was a lot of great questions. And uh, I want to thank everybody out there for, for their asking their, their great questions. Uh, it really added a lot to this conversation. But Kirsten, uh, thank you for this book. I, I I'm thoroughly love it. And, um, and I'm so glad it brought you, you know, here virtually with us to talk about it. And, uh, and good luck with the rest of the book tour. And, and again, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure.
And I just want to say to everybody else out there, we hope you guys had a, a great evening. Uh, stay tuned to hear who's next, who's next month's author is going to be. Uh, and we'll, we'll uh, keep uh, having these kinds of great conversations and I hope you'll join us again. Thanks and have a great night.